Hi, in this video lecture I'm going to be talking about Chromebox Alpha. Uh, one of the uh, primary measures of reliability that are used in psychometrics when people have scales that they've developed and they want to see if the scale itself is reliable. Chromebox Alpha really is the most commonly reported measurement of reliability. Uh, before I get into this, uh, let me mention that for my two different classes this semester, um, the, uh, the regular uh, version of the class, not the CBL version, but the regular so-called on-ground version of the class, of course we're not meeting on-ground, uh, I had to cancel this talk last week because I was sick. Uh, and so for, for that class, I'm asking you to review this uh, video outside of the regular online meetings in order to try to catch up in time. For the CBL version of the course, um, I think everybody was there in attendance when I talked about this, but um, uh, if you need to review it again, then you have it at your disposal so that you can review this information before doing your final project. Um, and if you're just, if you're a member of the public and you're just tuning in for information on Chromex Alpha, you'll still find this useful. This document uh, that I have in front of me, seven pages long, uh, this is available to students on the Canvas page, and I'm going to be using a data set um, from uh, one of my uh, studies that I did a number of years ago, a larger study. I'm going to be using uh, the uh, about 421 participants' responses on the right-wing authoritarianism scale. So you can find that, uh, that file, that authoritarianism file, on Canvas called RWA Small Clean File. Now I've looked through a number of different textbooks for uh, uh, the topic of Chromebox Alpha, even psychometrics textbooks. Uh, they really never have any discussion of how Chromebox Alpha is computed, and I think it's I think it's a useful thing to know. Although nobody ever does this by hand, but seeing how it is computed by hand is useful because it will give you a greater appreciation for what it is and what, uh, what Chromebox Alpha is really telling us. Now, uh, just to be clear, I'm not going to ask you to uh, calculate this by hand. So this uh, uh, example where I calculate it by hand is uh, purely for illustration. Uh, of course, we use computers for our actual work. But uh, whenever I learn a new statistic, I like, to, uh, I like to calculate it by hand and then see if I get the same answer using SPSS. Um, now, in, in terms of judging the quantity that is represented by <clears throat> Chromebox Alpha, you know, one of the first things to know is that uh, what we're talking about here in terms of alpha has nothing to do with the alpha that is part of significance testing, where alpha is the um, uh, essentially the p-value, the region of rejection is identified uh, by where you, where you place your alpha in the probability table. Uh, so this is something totally different. There are several different uh, ways in which the, the Greek letter alpha is used in statistics, and this is one of them. Uh, the, the statistic itself was developed by Lee Kronbach, and that's why it's called Kronbach's Alpha, in uh, the 1950s. He published uh, his formula. And in terms of judging the magnitude of alpha, uh, we're indebted to Robinson, Shaver, and Reitzman, uh, these uh, uh, three authors right here, uh, Lawrence Reitzman is um, one of the uh, leading early figures in legal psychology. And then uh, Shaver, uh, Phil Shaver and uh, Robinson, I believe, are both uh, social psychologists. So all three actually social psychologists. Um, and their textbook in 1991, it's really a compendium of different measures, different psychological scales. It's a classic in the field. Uh, even though those scales are rather old at this point, some of them, well, really many of them are still quite good and still in use today. Uh, but it's their introductory chapter in that text in their uh, book, The Measures of Personality and Social Psych uh, Psychological Attitudes, uh, that framed the, uh, the early um, benchmarks for understanding Chromebacks Alpha and other uh, issues related to good and, and poor uh, scale development. So they have they've got a table uh, where they show all these different um, 
uh, things such as the number of participants that are used, the type of samples that are used, um, whether you've correlated it with other similar scales, uh, and, and you know how many items have been developed in the item pool uh, that made up the scale, and they have rubrics uh, for each one of those. I'm just going to talk about the rubric for Chromebacks Alpha here because that's the topic for today. And you can see that uh, we've got um, just a very basic table or rubric here. And this is uh, adapted directly from Robinson, Shaver, and Reitzman. So if you have a, a Chromebacks Alpha uh, below 0.60, that's minimal or unac unacceptable. And you can think of this basically like a correlation in the sense that it cannot be greater than one. And higher is better in, in, a, in, in an important sense because uh, it's telling you something about the reliability of the scale. Um, you, you, cannot <coughs> you cannot have negative values here, only positive values. So unlike a correlation, we don't get negative values. Um, so below 0.6 is unacceptable or minimal. 0.60 to 0.69 is moderate, um, moderately good. Uh, 0.7 to 0.79 is extensive. I don't really know what they meant by extensive. I guess extensive evidence of the reliability of the scale. Um, and then 0.8 to 0.89 exemplary or very good. Uh, and then they used exemplary again, 0.9 above. 0.9 or above is also exemplary. I guess I would call this one very exemplary. Uh, and it's pretty rare that you get a scale that has a Chromebox Alpha this high. Um, usually what we see in terms of uh, good quality publish, published scales is they're somewhere in here, in this range, 0 0.8 to 0 0.89. Uh, and sometimes you get some scales that are just above that, maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.91, 0 0.92. But it's really very rare to see anything above 0.92. Uh, and I have seen published scales that seem to be reasonably good scales that had Chromebacks alphas that were in this range. So it does happen, particularly with uh, short scales, scales that only have a few items in it. They tend to have lower Chromebacks alpha. And, and that's, there's a very good reason for that because Chromebacks alpha is partially determined by the number of items that you have in the scale itself. So the more items you have, um, as long as the items are similarly correlated with each other, the higher the Chromebox Alpha will be. Uh, and so for this example, we'll work with the raw data uh, in the file named RWA small clean file. Uh, and uh, these are responses from over 400 participants in a study that I did. This is only part of the study. Um, I took out the other variables, so we only have the RWA variables. And for this exercise, I selected four items from the scale to, to work with as I calculated Chromebox Alpha by hand because uh, there's a lot of calculations and I didn't want to do any more than four items. The scale itself was originally created by uh, the Canadian researcher Bob Altmaier. And uh, Altmaier, uh, he's an interesting figure. He's a retired professor now. Uh, he may still be somewhat active in his research, uh, I'm not sure. But I've not seen any recent updates to his his web page. Uh, he's got uh, quite a bit of information, but it, it's about 10 years old or older uh, on his web page, his research web page. And uh, he started, Altmaier started researching the topic of authoritarianism in the 1970s, and he kept up on it for uh, well over 25 years. Published several books on the topic, and his uh, his last book in the series. Uh, he um, put the PDF, the full PDF of the book, available on his webpage for free download. So if you're interested in the topic, uh, this is where I got the scale from, uh, from his uh, book, The Authoritarians, which is available as a free download off of his webpage. And so that's a nice resource. Just Google Bob Altmaier, RWA, and you'll find it. Um, so let me, let me show you the questions on the scale just to get an idea of what the scale looks like. So here's, here's the set of questions. Uh, there are 20 questions in this version of the scale. Originally, the scale had 30 questions. And uh, Altmaier has the first couple of items, which I did not include here, are table setter items that have nothing to do with authoritarianism at all. 
So these are just the 20 items that uh, relate directly to authoritarianism. And again, he's been studying this topic for uh, many, many years. So there's there's a lot there's a ton of research using his scale. Uh, there there are critics of the concept of authoritarianism as to whether or not it's simply a, a different measure of uh, conservatism or conventionality. But uh, at any rate, the the items on the scale are supposed to tap into three different um, sub constructs. So RWA is your overall latent variable or construct, and it's supposed to partition out into three different sub-constructs of authoritarian aggression, authoritarian submission, and conventionalism. And as we look at these items, we might even be able to guess by the, uh, by the wording of the items which of the three different factors or components um, that these items load onto. Authoritarian aggression, authoritarian submission or conventionalism. When you have something like this, uh, gays and lesbians are just as healthy and moral as anyone else that's reverse coded so that the person who's high on authoritarianism would disagree with this item. And uh, that one clearly loads onto conventionalism. Um, what, what about the first one? This one is qualitatively different. Our country desperately needs a mighty leader who will do what has to be done to destroy the radical new ways of sinfulness that are ruining us. <laughs> Sounds like something uh, related to politics today in the 20th, uh, 21st century, uh, the year 2020 here in the United States. Um, uh, might makes right, and that, of course, is authoritarian aggression. Uh, and also, I should mention while we're um, while we're looking at the items here, notice that the items are statements, not questions. They're statements that the participant has then the ability to rate how much they agree or disagree with a statement. The scaling system, which is at the bottom of the document, is a seven-point scale, uh, where people rate the degree to which they strongly disagree to strongly agree and this would be coded as one, this would be coded as two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, so, you know, that's an important consideration uh, as to what type of a scaling system you want to use. Uh, if, you're, if you're using a published scale, then of course the best thing to do is use whatever the authors of the scale recommend, because if you're using a different scaling system than what other people use, then it makes the results not directly uh, comparable to other published studies. Uh, but uh, most commonly people use a seven point scale. Sometimes people use five or four point scales or uh, nine or 10 or even 11 point scales. I've seen a lot of variability in that area. Uh, but anyway, so uh, this, all, this scale itself is uh, available to you on Canvas. Uh, if you're in my class and if you're not in my class, you can get it from, I think it's page 18 or 19 of Altmaier's book, The Authoritarians. And again, if, if you're interested in that topic, then I highly recommend uh, the book as a free download. So going back to the Word document, uh, uh, Altmaier's uh, scale has typically been measured to have a Cronbach alpha over 0.9, making it a very highly reliable instrument. and yeah, I mean, he's had different versions of some of the items over the years. He's tweaked the items to make them better, and he's uh, changed, uh, swapped out some of the items and removed some. It, again, it used to be a 30-item 30, uh, 30 scale. Now it's a 20-item scale, which is good in, if you're, you know, short on time and you you have participants only for a limited uh, period of time. Um, but still, it's, it's, it has a, a exemplary uh, Cronbach's Alpha, exemplary reliability. So it's been uh, very heavily researched. You can probably find hundreds of studies using it, uh, even perhaps thousands. Now, as I wrote here, and uh, I wrote this, uh, this document uh, in full myself, uh, uh, essentially encapsulating my lecture on the topic, you can think of Alpha as the proportion of the thing that you're trying to measure that is captured by the items that you have. Uh, so the latent variable is the thing that you're trying to capture and you don't have direct access to it. Um, true score theory in psychometrics operates under the assumption that if you have uh, 
a universe of possible items that would measure your latent variable, uh, any sample of items that you collect are a random selection of the items from that universe of items. And of course the universe of possible items that you can generate to measure some construct or latent variable is limitless, but if you had the ability to completely exhaust every single possible item that could be made in order to measure this underlying construct, um, and if you had those scores, then that would be the true score of the latent variable. But we don't have that ability. We don't have the ability to measure everything that there is to measure about the latent variable. Uh, of course, it would, it would just be um, uh, an unending task that, uh, uh, you, I mean, the computations on that would be amazing. But uh, at least that's, that's the idea theoretically according to the um, true score theory. Um, so our, our best thing, our best case scenario is that we have a set of items that are uh, essentially a random sample of this universe of possible items. And alpha, if you square that number, uh, uh, so let's say alpha is 0 0.90. If you square the alpha, you get 0.81. And the scale then can be thought of as measuring 81% of the underlying construct, which is a pretty good amount. And so another way to think about that is if you take the complement of 0.81, so one, this is the complement of 0.81, one minus 0.81 equals 0.19 or 19%. And that means that there's 19% measurement error in the scale. So if you have a scale that is way up here, it's measuring a very large chunk of this latent variable that you're trying to capture, whatever it happens to be, uh, and there's not very much noise. However, if you have a Cronbach's alpha that's down here in this, in this rubric, somewhere down here, uh, then not only are you not capturing that much of the latent variable, but you're also going to be having a lot of noise. And that's why it's better to have a higher Cronbach's alpha. So that's an important thing to understand in terms of interpreting Cronbach's alpha. It is essentially a measurement of the amount of the latent variable, the thing that you're trying to measure, that you're actually capturing in the scale, at least according to true score theory. Now, of course, we don't always know uh, everything that there is to know about the uh, latent variable. And so if we, if we devise um, some uh, kind of uh, decently constructed yet crappy scale that doesn't adequately measure all the facets of the latent variable, then we're not really getting at the true thing that we're hoping to get at. So there's a difference there in terms of reliability and validity. We can have a scale that's highly reliable, but it's off the mark in terms of not actually measuring what we think that it's measuring in terms of the meaning of the latent variable as we're thinking about it. So with the, um, with the right-wing authoritarianism scale, I mentioned there'd been some controversy about it. And that controversy typically uh, revolves around, uh, you know, some kind of a debate about what is it exactly that uh, right-wing authoritarianism is, is measuring? Is it, is it merely political ideology? Is it merely conventionalism? Or is there something more to it than that? Um, and uh, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of back and forth between uh, some researchers in that field. Uh, it's kind of interesting to read it. Uh, um, in, in spite of the controversy, it's been a very popular scale uh, for researchers to use. And it seems to measure something important in relation to racism and discrimination. Um, so if we go back to the interpretation of the numbers themselves, uh, only very highly consistent scales get this high in terms of having 81% of the underlying construct being explained by the scale itself. Uh, let's uh, look at some numbers that are not as good. So if you had a scale where your Cronbach's alpha was determined to be 0.85, when you square that it's 0.72, meaning that there's a 28% amount of measurement error. And when alpha is uh, 0.65, it can be called moderate, 
according to the benchmark up here. So if it's 0.65, it would be uh, called a moderate, uh, um, moderately good scale in terms of Cronbach's alpha. Uh, but uh, such a scale would have an alpha that has 58% measurement error. So it's, you know, as you go further down, you can see that it, um, uh, the amount of error uh, goes up rather quickly. And two additional points to make here. Uh, and the first is that Cronbach's alpha is partially determined by the length of the scale. Simply adding more items will increase the value of alpha. And I demonstrate that mathematically later in this document. Uh, this is why we often see scales that are lengthy and they seem to be filled with items that are highly similar to each other. They have to be highly similar to each other because they're measuring the same construct. As long as you have more items that correlate similarly with the uh, previously created items, then adding you know five or ten more items will substantially increase the value of Cronbach's alpha, even though the items are no better than the pre-existing ones. So just add more items and Cronbach's alpha will get a lot higher. So that's one consideration. And the second is that it's fairly easy uh, to create scale items that correlate highly with each other. If you just have wording of items that are very similar, then you're going to have artificially high correlations between the items. Consider the three items below that I made up just for this discussion. I would accept I would expect that these three items correlate very highly with each other. And I, you know, I just made these up. Um, children need a good learning environment to truly excel. And the person who's answering this, this uh, survey or scale, uh, maybe it's a parent, and uh, the, you ask the person to rate on a seven point scale how much they agree or disagree with this. And of course, if they're a parent of the child in question, then they're going to uh, put a, a six or a seven in terms of strong agreement with this item. And then the second one, having caring teachers is important for children to learn. Well, yeah, I mean, that's really the same thing as the first one. So these, the, se the first and the second items here really have essentially the same meaning, although I express them using uh, different uh, phrasing. Uh, but you can see that these two, we would expect these to have very, highly uh, very high correlation with each other. And then the third one, Classrooms that are overcrowded can impede a child's academic progress. So that's a third one that deals with the learning environment. All three of these deal with the learning environment that the child has in one form or another. So as long as the items themselves are highly similar with each other, you're going to naturally get very strong correlations between them. And that's going to drive up Cronbach's alpha. Um, and it, you know when you're creating these scales, as I'm having uh, students in this class do, uh, when you're creating scales to measure some construct or latent variable, uh, it can be very challenging after you get to the 15th or 20th item to keep creating more because they all start to sound alike. And, uh, and that's natural. But the thing is, is that each item is assumed to measure um, part uh, of the um, latent variable in terms of a unique contribution to that uh, description of the latent variable. Uh, even though there's going to be a lot of overlap between the items themselves, there's going to be a lot of shared variance between the items themselves uh, with uh, other items. Each of the items is is probably going to have uh, the ability to explain at least a little bit of unique variance of the latent variable. So each one contributes a little bit. If it doesn't contribute, uh, statistically speaking, then it should be removed from the scale. And uh, this type of analysis is one of the ways to do it. Okay, so let's skip past the rest of that text and let's move on. Here's the uh, mathematical mathematical example. Four items, RWA 15, 16, 17, and 18, and I've got a table of correlations here. Uh, this is the table of correlations. Uh, always remember that uh, any variable correlated with itself is one. And then this, uh, if we cross index here, RWA 15 correlates with RWA 16 at 0.206. So that's, you know, between a small and medium correlation. Uh, according to Cohen, uh, 0.1 is small, 0.3 is medium, 0.5 is large when interpreting effect size R. 
uh, we can apply the same rule to correlations, generally speaking. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but I won't go into that here. And some of these are kind of low, like this one. This correlation here is kind of low. And it's okay if you have variables, or let's uh, say items, that have some low correlations with the other items, as long as they make up for it with higher correlations for different items. So while item 16 doesn't seem to correlate very well with item 17, it correlates really well with item 18. So it's okay if you have some weak correlations, as long as those particular items correlate better with some of the other items. So this is our starting point. Cronbach's alpha is based on the uh, table of correlations. It's, that's the basis for it all. Um, and we can, we can examine the table of correlations to see uh, which ones are weakly correlated uh, and uh, more strongly correlated. We can also calculate the mean or average of the correlations. Uh, and I use the definition here from Nunnally and Bernstein. Uh, Jum Nunnally was uh, uh, in the mid 20th century, uh, mid to you know 1970s, 1980s, considered to be the leading figure in psychometric theory. And his textbook on psychometrics, Nunnally and Bernstein's text on psychometrics, uh, was used in all of the graduate programs in psychology uh, for psychometrics, uh, you know, throughout uh, the second half of the 20th century. Uh, I certainly uh, had it as my textbook. Um, it, I don't think it's really used anymore, but I keep it. I keep it in my desk or you know in, in my office uh, as a, as a reference book. Um, so uh, Nunley and Bernstein identify the uh, uh, mean correlation like this. It's just the the mean of R uh, for the items uh, in the scale, and so you you take all the different correlations among the items and the, you add them together, you sum them up, and divide by the number of uh, correlations. So what we're doing here is we're just taking the, we're just taking the uh, lower half of the diagonal. I'm highlighting it here to make it uh, clear. So we're taking those six correlations because of course it's a mirror image on the top half of the di diagonal. Take those correlations, take the average of them, and you have the average correlation, which is a pretty good measure of the uh, inter-item reliability of a scale, uh, but that was that served as sort of a starting point in psychometric theory for the later advancement of uh, Cronbach's alpha. So the mean correlation is useful, but there are better uh, there are better uh, ways to do this, and that's done by using a variance covariance matrix, where the diagonal here uh, going down this way, the diagonal represents the variance of an individual item. Uh, so item uh, RWA, one, uh, I changed the, the numbers here, I should probably change them back. So that's uh, 15, 16, 17, and 18. That just makes it a little bit uh, easier. So that, that would be the comparison with up here. Uh, the reason why I didn't do that is because I didn't want to put the subscripts on all of these. So let me get rid of those. You can see the subscripts down here, where it's covariance 2, 1. That's the covariance of item number 2 right here with item number 1. I just I didn't want to have 14s and 15s and 16s and 17s and so on <coughs> when I did the uh, subscripts. So at any rate, the variance of item 1 is if you took the standard formula for the variance, this is the population formula, uh, the sum of squares, which is the numerator, divided by n, that's, that gives you the variance of that um, of the behavior on that item. And if we look at the SPSS file here, you know, this would be the variance of all these scores right here for item 1, if we were working on item 1. And then the covariance is a measurement of the amount to which the different items are covariating with each other. Now the numbers here are really the same things that you see here in the correlation table. It's just that the correlation table has been standardized so that the variance of an item with itself is one. And uh, it's you're going to get exactly the same information here, but it's this is expressed in raw score units 
uh, whereas this is expressed in standardized units, standardized so that the variance is 1. That's the only real difference. Uh, so now consider the same table, the variance covariance matrix, but instead of using the words, I use the symbols for variance, which is sigma squared, and uh, then the covariance, which is sigma sub 2, 1, the different numbers of the items that we're getting the covariance of. So uh, again, it's not necessary for, for you as you follow this to, uh, to try to memorize any of this. It's, that's not the purpose here. Uh, the purpose is just to show you mathematically how this works and then do it using SPSS. Um, okay, so the diagonal shows the variance for each item. I pulled these out of SPSS um, and I use this pathway options cross products. Uh, and uh, so I get the, the variance covariance matrix, plug in the numbers. Um, and the thing to understand here is that the diagonal, oops, the, I'm trying to highlight just this in blue. The diagonal here represents the non communal variance of the items. Whereas the off diagonal, the yellow highlighted parts, represents the communal or shared variance. So these are two different components, the non-communal variance, which is the diagonal, and the communal variance, which is the off-diagonal elements. And these two things tell us uh, something very important and different about the ways that the numbers and the scale are relating with each other. And it, it's all based on true score theory, where <coughs> according to classical test theory, which is sort of synonymous with true score theory, true score equals the observed score minus error. That is to say, when you have an observed score, the observed score is never the true representation of the thing that you're trying to measure. The observed score always has some error of measurement in it. So the, the true score is equal to the observed score plus or uh, I guess minus error. Um, and uh, so down here, where the true score is the accurate measure of the ability being measured, uh, the problem is that we cannot ever, ever measure the true score accurately. We have the only access, we only have access to the observed scores, which are influenced by the true scores, but also uh, the observed scores are influenced by error of measurement. Thus, any score that you can observe is the combination of true score plus error. So that's represented here. Any score that you can observe, any psychological measurement that you can observe, when you ask somebody to answer some kind of a question, that is your observed score, and that's a combination of true score plus error. And we never know what the true score is. Well, there are ways to try to tell, and that's what Cronbach's Alpha is all about. Um, and it, it, it's sort of like trying to detect the uh, presence of a, uh, a large body in space by uh, that you can't see because it's too far away and it's invisible to us using our telescopes, but we're trying to uh, estimate where it is based on how the gravitational field affects other things that we can see. That's sort of what we're doing here. Uh, so so using this as a jumping off point, furthermore, what's called the coefficient of reliability is equal to the true score divided by the observed score, but again, we don't have the true score. Uh, and, and so we can't measure these directly. If all observed scores are made up of true score plus error, and if we assume that all error is independent, in other words, random and normally distributed, then all common variance among a set of observations must be caused by the true score. That is to say, all the highlighted parts, all the common variance must be caused by the true score. So that's, that's our way of using the, the impact of the magnetic field on the things that we can see to try to find out something about the thing that we can't see. <coughs> Which is, I mean, it's kind of cool. Um, so think of it this way. Uh, for any given set of items on a test, the set of items will have some common variance, that is to say they go up or down together, as well as some non-common variance which is to say random noise that is not attributable to skill, aptitude, knowledge, or whatever the thing is that we're trying to measure. 
the variance that the items have in common must be caused by the true score while the noise is not caused by the true score. Uh, and the covariance of the items is a representation of the shared variance that in classical test theory is caused by the true score. Uh, the variance of the items uh, represents the variance of the individual items, that is to say the diagonal in the variance covariance matrix is the part that's random noise. Thus, drum roll, examination of the covariances of a set of items will reveal the amount of common variability caused by the true score and each individual item's variance will reflect the uh, unique error or independent error associated with that. So now we can do something useful, finally. Uh, we can do something useful in terms of calculating a metric for reliability. Uh, using our variance covariance matrix, we can calculate the sum of the variances of the four items, and this will reveal the amount of error or noise. And we can also obtain the total observed variance by simply adding all of the uh, elements uh, within the matrix itself. All the observed variance would be the variance of everything in the entire in the entire matrix. That's the total observed variance. So now uh, let's do the math. We have two different uh, small formulas here. The sum of sigma squared is the sum, that's this one, sum of sigma squared is the sum of the variances moving down the diagonal starting at the top left and that shows the non-common or unique variance which is error. And then uh, sigma squared sub y is the variance of the scale itself, which is composed of k items, which is the total number of elements within the variance covariance matrix. And this is calculated by summing all of the elements, each cell within the scale's variance covariance matrix. And this sum literally represents the variance of the entire scale. So if I did this for all 20 items on the RWA scale, if I, if I summed all of the variance covariance matrix, it would be a very large table for the 20 items on the uh, RWA scale for my sample, I would have the total variance of the scale. That's what that means. So now calculating this out, I get the, uh, the non-joint variance by summing together the diagonals, and then I get the total scale variance by summing together all of the elements. I used some dashes here to symbolize. I didn't want to put the, all of them down here, but that's all of the different uh, elements within that table came out to be 22.913. Uh, and we can also calculate the common variance, which is the amount of variability caused by the true score by adding together the off-diagonal elements, which are the covariances. And you can also compute that by taking this number, the total observed variance, and subtracting this number, oops, subtracting this number from it which is 22.913 minus 11.353. That's a shortcut. And that tells you the, uh, the variance of the, um, the off-diagonal elements, which are the, the covariances. And then using this information, we can compute the ratio of non-common or non-joint variance to total variance using this formula. So it's just dividing the non-joint by the total and that gives us 0.495. And this number represents the proportion of non-joint variation, uh, which is essentially noise, to the total variation of the scale. In other words, 49.5% of the variability of the raw scores is random error or noise that is not attributable to the thing that we're measuring. And uh, ideally, we want to get more of it than that. But this is only four items on a 20 item scale. Now, we can also take the complement of this, where uh, 1 minus a proportion gives you the complement of that proportion. So 1 minus this number, 1 minus uh, 0.495, gives us 0 0.505. And that is, if we transform that into a percentage, then that tells us the percentage of variance uh, that the four items in the part of the scale that we're looking at uh, the proportion of variance that these explain of the latent variable. Uh, or an, a different way of thinking about it is it's 50.5% caused by the true score. That's the, you know, our, our, our four items that we're looking at 
uh, the behavior on those items, 50.5% of it is caused by the true score. Uh, so next, then here's where Chromeback comes in. Um, so this was recognized first, and it, I think initially in the 1940s, this is what was used. Uh, but uh, uh, Lee Chromeback in 1951 modified the formula a little bit uh, by using the number of items where K equals the number of items. So it's the number of items divided by the number of items minus one. And then you multiply that by the complement of the uh, amount of error in the scale, which I did above. And so it's um, here we have four items in the scale. So four divided by three, and then multiply that by 0 0.505. And the answer comes out to be 0 0.67, uh, 0 0.673. So that's Chromebacks alpha for this set of items. That's how you uh, that's how you calculate Chromebacks alpha, and really, I mean, nobody ever does this. Nobody ever does this when they teach uh, Chromebacks alpha. Is, at least I've not seen it. Uh, I think it's a kind of a handy thing to know because it helps us uh, interpret what's going on. So alpha represents the proportion of the total variance in the scale that is communal, and is thus caused by the latent variable uh, or true score. Thus, the error of the scale will equal the complement of alpha squared. So the error variance is the complement of this number. Uh, so that's if that's Chromebacks alpha, you take the square of that, uh, take the complement of that, uh, and then that is the um, the uh, the amount of error. Uh, also, in an alternate, to, uh, I'll show with SPSS how to do this in a second. Let's see if we get the same number. An alternate formula for Chromebacks alpha reveals more of its character. Uh, this is an alternate formula for the same thing. So if we take the mean of the correlations, which I computed earlier in this document, and multiply it by the number of items. So k, uh, k is the number of items. So four times the uh, mean of the correlations, the mean of the correlations. And then one plus uh, k minus one times the mean of the correlations. So I do the math down here, and you see that you get the same thing. 0.673, and up here points. So the two formulas do the same thing. One uses the mean of the correlations, and the other uses the variance covariance matrix. And of course, they give you the same thing because it's just um, uh, you know uh, arithmetic substitution at different uh, stages. Uh, but this this one tells us more about the character of Chromebacks Alpha because you can see that it's dependent on the number of items. And uh, if you wanted to, you could even uh, you can even make an estimate. Uh, you can even make an estimation of what Chromebacks Alpha will be if I added more items that had a similar correlation with each other as the four that I already have. So if I created 16 more items, so that I have a total of 20 items, and I have a similar uh, mean correlation, because you know the future items are going to be roughly equal to the present items, and so you know the correlations between them should be about the same. Uh, this is what my Chromebacks Alpha will look, look like, and that is called the Spearman-Brown prophecy formula. Spearman-Brown prophecy formula. So uh, you know if you have a few items created, and you calculate the mean of those uh, correlations between the items you can very easily use this formula. I mean, you could do this uh, on a hand calculator on your phone. Um, you can calculate what uh, alpha will be if you add uh, 10 or 20 more items or whatever. OK, so that's that's a good explanation, I think, for Chromebacks Alpha. Uh, the rest of this document is screenshots of SPSS. Let me just show you on SPSS how we do this. So we go to uh, Analyze. Uh, scale reliability analysis. That's the pathway to get to Chromebacks Alpha. And you can see that I've got it, uh, I've got the 20 items in the scale here. I only used these four numbers 15, 16, 17, and 18. Carry them over. If you, uh, if you want, you can highlight multiple items at a time by holding the shift key down. That's how I did that. I uh, highlighted one, held the shift key down, and then moved it to, to the endpoint where I wanted it. And down here, you see it says alpha. That's Chromebacks alpha. You can see that there are different forms here. Split half, 
Let me actually move that up a little bit, make sure it gets in the screen. Uh, split half, Goodman parallel, strictly parallel. I've used split half occasionally, but uh, primarily you use alpha. And any published uh, scale, when people publish a new scale, uh, it's pretty much a requirement that they have to report what the alpha level is. And uh, when you read these articles, now you know what it means. So let's look at the options under statistics. You always, when you do this, you always want to check these three. You might also want to look at the correlations. You probably do not need the covariances. Uh, but these are the three most important things to have uh, if you're judging the psychometric properties of the reliability of the scale itself. So always get those in there. Hit continue and hit OK. And so what we have here in our output, uh, it tells us the sample size. Uh, the uh, We have uh, full data on 416. Some were excluded because of missing data. It's actually kind of a lot. It was an internet-based survey, so it's not surprising. Uh, and it tells me that Chromevax Alpha is uh, 0.673. Well, if I go back to my Word document, there's the number that I computed using a uh, formula. And so I can see that I have exactly the right number. So uh, uh, SPSS gives us the same answer as the formula does. So that's good news. I always like it when that happens. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes I have to try several times. Uh, you get the means and standard deviations for the items, which is always good to know. Uh, and the correlation table. And then down here, and this is the most important thing, this last column over here, Chromebax Alpha if item deleted. So if the Chromebax Alpha is 0.673, will the deletion of any of the items make it go up? According to this, it says no. But if you had a if you had an item that was particularly bad, then this is where you would identify it because it would give you a number here that's higher for Chromebacks Alpha than the one that's here. And that's how you identify an item that you might want to get rid of because it's not working well with the rest of them. You'll also be able to spot it probably in the intercorrelations. So essentially, in conclusion, Chromebacks Alpha is the in a sense, the average of the item total correlations uh, that each item has with the rest of the scale. If you take all of those item total correlations of each item with the rest of the scale and then you take the average of all of those averages, that's Chromebacks Alpha. So it, it's, a, it's a primarily a measure of how well the items are working together. And so now you know what it is and you know how to compute it using SPSS that uh, I think that'll wrap it up. Thanks. Take care.